Hello, my name is Ian McLennan. I'm a Vancouver-based consultant working with planetariums, museums, and science centers, a longtime member of the International Planetarium Society, and in turn, of course, a member of the Canadian Association of Science Centers. And if we had been meeting in Edmonton for the IPS conference, this is a poster session that I would have presented at that time. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic interfered with those plans, and so here we are. My own career in planetariums began in the early 1960s when I was appointed director of the Queen Elizabeth Planetarium that was built in Edmonton to commemorate the visit to that city of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth a year earlier in 1959. None of us knew what we were doing at that time in terms of uh, planetarium planning, and so we had ordered a simple dodecahedron Spitz A2 planetarium projector, and we had to surround the theater with many dozens of uh, special effects projectors and musical effects and so forth. But the shows were quite popular, partly because uh, we used the background in broadcasting that I had as, long as, as, as well as with David Roger, uh, who succeeded me as director of the planetarium, when I moved on to Rochester, New York. David, in the meantime, moved on to Vancouver, where he became director of the H.R. McMillan Space Center Planetarium, and uh, I moved to Rochester, New York, and became the founding director of the Strassenburg Planetarium, a rather famous institution because of the many technical and programming innovations that took place there. It, it was, among other things, the world's first computerized planetarium. The Strassenburg came on stream just at the beginning of the space age, particularly around the time of the great lunar landings, Apollo 11 and so forth, and also at the time of uh, the introduction of the film 2001, A Space Odyssey. In fact, Arthur C. Clarke, the author of 2001, visited us at the Strassenburg, and uh, here we see him in front of the portrait of Edwin and Clara Strassenburg, uh, which, which was captured by the famous Canadian photographer Yusuf Karsh. At the end of my tenure as director of the uh, Museum and Science Centre in uh, Rochester, I moved back to Canada and uh, became the first full-time director of Ontario Place in Toronto which was uh, like a, almost a permanent world expo. It was the home of the world's first IMAX theater, and these gigantic pods had many exhibitions and special events, and exhibitions including uh, audiovisual shows by Oscar Peterson, Morley Markson, Christopher Chapman, and other famous multimedia producers. The Cinesphere is a possible location for a new planetarium in Toronto, uh, and in fact, planning has progressed over the recent years uh, with the idea of re-establishing a planetarium in that city. It is one of the very few very large cities in the world without a major planetarium. Uh, the planetarium that once existed there, the McLaughlin Planetarium, was associated with the Royal Ontario Museum. It was uh, one of the largest planetariums in the world. It was a 24-meter dome. Uh, I think 475 seats. Uh, it had a variety of programming. In fact, I produced one of the shows there, it coincident with the Treasures of Tutankhamun exhibition at the Royal Ontario Museum. Uh, we produced the show in Egypt with Omar Sharif and uh, other notables uh, contributing to that uh, production. One of the people we worked with in the uh, Toronto area as far as the planetarium was concerned was the famous Canadian astronomer Helen Sawyer Hogg, who coined the phrase, the stars belong to everyone. She actually wrote a book by that name. She was a wonderful person to work with and uh, is fondly remembered. I got wind of uh, ha something happening in Vancouver and moved there in the early 1980s because of Expo 86 that was on stream for planning. And in fact, I became a part of the planning team that put together the initial cultural programming for Expo 86 and eventually took over as a co-manager and uh, artistic director of the United Nations Pavilion at Expo 86. 
And one of the features in that uh, remarkable pavilion, which was voted consistently one of the 10 best pavilions on the expo site, was a production that we did called Island in Space. And it look, took a look at the Earth as a planet, as a blue marble in space, inspired by the writings of Carl Sagan and by Jacques Cousteau and many others of, uh, of that time who were uh, leading the environmental movement. After Expo 86, I moved on to, Ro uh, to uh, uh, Brisbane, Australia, uh, and uh, did the uh, United Nations and UNICEF Pavilion at the World Expo 88 in Brisbane. And among the features of that, we uh, engaged the services of uh, Australia's most famous graphics designer, Ken Doan, who uh, contributed his wonderful designs to the pavilion and, in fact, became a UNICEF ambassador after that. I came back to Vancouver in the early 1990s and uh, have been consulting ever since and one of my early consulting assignments was with the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles. We had a 60 million dollar renovation program for that grand old Art Deco building and we didn't want to disturb the building itself and so we went underground in order to create a major new exhibition space that uh, was uh, really quite a, a beautiful space. And I worked with Ed Krupp, the director of the Griffith Observatory, uh, who had a philosophy that he wanted every visitor to the observatory to become an observer. And when you have a touchstone like that in your uh, planning, it, it gives you something that you can measure every idea, every exhibition idea against. And uh, that was a very useful uh, touchstone for us to uh, measure the, the various ideas for exhibitions. We looked at the outside of the space as well, and uh, we d designed a Gottlieb Transit Corridor and Meridian, uh, a, a really exciting sculptural space, quite esoteric and academic, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, a great place for instruction and with the constant sunlight in Southern California. It was a marvelous installation. We worked with Bruce Bohannon, a Canadian astronomer uh, who helped us uh, with the design of that particular feature. Another one of the projects I worked on at that time uh, in the early 1990s was in Hawaii. Uh, the the idea was that uh, many people wanted to visit the great observatories on the top of Mauna Kea, on the big island of Hawaii, but that was completely impractical. It's at the 14,000 foot level, and so uh, it, it, and it interrupts the scientific investigations. And so they wanted to build a major visitor center in the center of the city. And uh, so we eventually came up with a plan to build the Imaloa Astronomy Center of Hawaii at the University of Hawaii in Hilo. The first idea was to create a bridge between the traditional Polynesian elders and the astronomical community because there had been some historical tension there. And this exhibition center actually uh, shone a bright light on that and created some additional problems at first, but those did get sorted out. I worked with Aldrich Pears Design in Vancouver and Science North in Sudbury, Ontario, and uh, we produced uh, some really lovely exhibits, and I worked specifically on the planetarium. There was exciting landscaping as part of the design of the Imaloa Astronomy Center, native uh, to uh, Hawaii, of course. One of the people I got to work with there was Michael West, uh, who uh, took me observing at the Subaru telescope on top of Mauna Kea at one point. Uh, Michael eventually went on to become the scientific director at Lowell Observatory, and I'll have a little bit more to say about that in a few moments. The uh, Imaloa Planetarium that I worked on was a unique uh, facility in as much as we wanted to do some experiments there, both from a technical and programming point of view. Um, and the opening of the facility in 2011 coincided with the passage in front of Mercury of the Mercury Messenger spacecraft. And in the opening show, the pictures that had come in half an hour before to NASA 
we included in the opening show of the planetarium. The Imaloa Planetarium was the world's first 3D stereo planetarium, and of course when you're the first in anything, you make a lot of mistakes, and uh, we, it was a learning experience. Um, it, it was a wonderful th thing in terms of looking at things like rotating planets or the surface of Mars, but the, uh, the goggles were expensive, they absorbed 70% of the light, and they created a tunnel effect which negated the advantages of having a full dome. So it was with mixed success that we installed that first world premier 3D planetarium. Close to that, in Kona on the Big Island, uh, my friend uh, John Lomberg uh, set up a galaxy garden that uh, has been replicated in a couple of other places. It's a wonderful spot where you can stand inside a replica of the Milky Way galaxy. And when I stood inside that and realized that there's one leaf that includes everything that we can see with the unaided eye, it gives you an amazing perspective on the scale of our universe. Another one of the projects that I worked on overseas uh, with Bill Chomick, uh, the architect from Casey and Architects in Calgary, was the Eugenitas Foundation Planetarium in Athens. We worked with the planetarium director, Dennis Simopoulos, a wonderful guy. And more recently, we worked with uh, Manos Kitsanos, uh, the Greek representative, Middle East representative uh, to the IPS. Uh, that was a, an amazing project. Uh, we, we, it, they had enough money because of the benefactors that uh, they could uh, do everything at a first-class rate. In more recent years, I've worked uh, along with my co-consultant, Bill, Ch uh, Bill Peters, as well as Bill Chomick, uh, at the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. This observatory was founded in uh, 1896 by Percival Lowell in order to observe the opposition of Mars at that time. He was fascinated by the prospect of life on Mars. And uh, he dictated that the observatory should forever engage in leading edge research and public education. And every director since that time has respected those twin pillars. I've been working, as I said, with Bill Peters, as well as Juan Tanis from Key Space Design. And uh, one of the people we've also worked with is uh, Kevin Schindler, the historian at Lowell Observatory. He's showing us here, along with Diana Coleman from Yerkes Observatory, the original drawings and documentation from the discovery of Pluto in 1930 by Clyde Tombaugh, whom I actually met at one point during the uh, Neptune encounter, the Uranus encounter uh, uh, from Voyager. Uh, one of the things we opened uh, recently in October of uh, last year was the Geo Valley Open Deck Observatory. And uh, this is a wonderful space with uh, six very high-end telescopes on a patio with a sliding roof that comes and covers the telescopes for inclement weather and overnight. And uh, it's a, a, an absolutely marvelous place. And during this COVID uh, pandemic, we've taken advantage of the closing of the observatory to the public in order to install uh, these wonderful phosphorescent uh, walkways throughout the site, which will be amazing for people when the site gets repopulated with the public again. And you can see here the observatory with, in the background, the recent uh, Neowise comet that uh, made its recent appearance is now receding. One of the features that we're uh, designing for Lowell Observatory is the uh, Marley Foundation D uh, Astronomy Discovery Center, which is going to be quite a marvelous center. And one of its main features will be this universe theater, which will have a gigantic wraparound screen, a multimedia screen with a large overhead circular screen with planetarium capability. We've also been working with the Lowell team uh, on a variety of new technologies and new ideas, new programming ideas. Among other things, we're designing a major new children's gallery and working on a number of different concepts with that, with Key Space Design and Juan Tanis here in Vancouver. And another one of the features on the rooftop of the uh, Astronomy Discovery Center will be this open deck 
or Dark Sky Planetarium. It's a fully equipped planetarium with heated seats uh, and uh, projection equipment for uh, looking at close-ups of planets and uh, galaxies, but no dome. We'll be looking at the real sky above us, and this is going to be quite an exciting new development. This is going to be opening in 2023. Our inspiration for this was originally the Shoemaker Open Air Planetarium in Chico, California, uh, and there's another open air planetarium that's been designed and opened a couple of years ago in Glen Sutton, Quebec, about an hour and a half outside of Montreal. And we've noted that McDonald Observatory in the west of Texas also has an open deck uh, planetarium, uh, some circular ring seats that the public can uh, sit in and uh, enjoy the uh, night sky with a presenter in the middle giving a live presentation. There's a new alliance uh, cover, uh, just uh, covered in the last couple of years of uh, historic observatories, and uh, these are, include Palomar and Mount Wilson and Lick and Yerkes and Lowell. And recently we had a meeting just before the pandemic, um, and here I'm meeting with uh, Ed Krupp and uh, Jeff Hall from uh, Griffith and Lowell Observatories. And uh, one of the observatories that we've been working on, and uh, Bill Peters and I wrote the master plan for the reopening of Yerkes Observatory in Williams Bay, Wisconsin. As many of you will know, that observatory was operated for 123 years by the University of Chicago. But in 2018, they uh, withdrew their support for the operation of Yerkes. And so we are now uh, working with a private foundation that was formed by Diana Coleman in Williams Bay to uh, re-establish the observatory. And we're raising millions of dollars now to restore the telescope, to restore the observatory to its former glory, working with various architects and designers and with Ed Struble, who is the on-site manager there. A little closer to home, at least, at least in terms of the country I live in, uh, I also worked on the planetarium in Montreal, Quebec, uh, which is uh, rather famous for its twin domes. One of the uh, domes uh, is for science and the other is for art. And it also is the home of a, a splendid exhibition area, which includes, among other things, uh, a fragment from the Chelyabinsk meteorite that fell in uh, Siberia. The uh, Arty Dome allows us to have musical and uh, poetic events uh, that are kind of free from the constraints of scientific investigation, while the Science Dome is more for pragmatic and didactic astronomy and includes a uh, Konica Minolta projector that uh, faithfully rep reproduces the night sky. Of course, you don't need a very large planetarium in order to do uh, astronomy for the public. And in fact, sometimes a smaller planetarium is the ideal thing, especially for very young children, for preschool children. That's something that interests me greatly. And here at the Ontario Science Center in Toronto, there is a small planetarium that uh, specializes, among other things, in programming for very young children. And one of the effects that I love is if a child gets restless or gets afraid of the dark or whatever, they bring this little moon face doll over to the child and it lights up and uh, the child settles down immediately and it's quite a wonderful thing to see. Uh, they do the same thing in Seattle and Santa Barbara and a couple of other places and uh, this whole idea of preschool uh, education for children interests me greatly. And in that context, the Queen Elizabeth Planetarium, and I'm coming full circle here, in Edmonton uh, has been fully restored, and it was going to be uh, one of the key things that would be opened at the time of the IPS conference in Edmonton. And I've been promoting the idea of that planetarium as a place that would specialize in early childhood astronomy education. And in that context, I've been working with Frank Florian, who is the Canadian representative to the IPS now, as well as Alan Nersall and others. And uh, we, we certainly wish that uh, that IPS conference could have gone ahead and where we could have introduced these concepts to everybody in a more visceral sense. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this. Merci beaucoup. And I've put my 
email address on here if anybody would like more information about any of these projects. Bye for now.